Um, so as, as Jeff said, I live in Nashville. I'll tell you a little bit about myself and my background because that's really important to kind of tell you where I'm coming from with my approach. Uh, because as as I uh, as I've gone through my career, I found that there are you know I used to kind of think, well, I must be doing it the right way because this is working. And what I found is that there are so many wonderful ways to approach trumpet that work very well, and we're all set up different with our, our faces and, and different equipment. And so this is, my, this is the way that's worked for me. This is what's helped me develop uh, into the player I am. So basically, I started off um, from a real regimented classical approach. Uh, my trumpet teacher was in a military band and he, he was very specific in how he wanted me to practice. I was telling Jeff this morning that um, before he have even let me triple tongue into the trumpet, he had me for two weeks just go, be, go around, you know, wherever I was walking around, just going, you know, on and on. So, you know, when I, when I picked it up, you know, after stuttering a couple times, I could do it really well. But it was because of his approach. So, uh, you know, it wouldn't slap your fingers with a ruler or anything, but he was real specific on what he expected from me. So I had that classical background, and I would practice what he gave me, and then the rest of my practice time, so that was exercises and figuring that out, and then the rest of my practice time was playing along with records, which was Doc Severinsen and Nana Ferguson, and uh, these brothers called the Omen Brothers, probably never heard of those guys, but... Um, so I play along with that type of thing, and uh, I play on my, on my cornet until my chops swelled in one mouthpiece, and then I'd put another mouthpiece in until, you know, until I was just shut down, and then I'd throw the you know, cornet on the couch and go play outside. So that's, that's my background, and it was kind of a mixed bag, very classical, but playing a lot of high notes because that's what I enjoy, and that's what I heard. Um, uh, went through, you know, went to high school and I got braces because my parents said, oh, you need braces, you know, to keep you crooked. And uh, my range went way down and I started having to work a lot harder for what I was doing and I realized that, you know, because of the way I was naturally made, my teeth, the way they were shaped and everything like that, they had kind of given me uh, ease of, of range and endurance and brilliant sound, those kind of things. And uh, so I struggled with that, and I was just getting more and more serious. And I, was, and I had the ones on the inside, because trumpet was in, important for me, so I, I put, uh, I had, I guess they were called linguas. Uh, so I had those, and so by the time I got to college, I was really struggling to, to play in the upper register. You know, I'd lost, I had E's above double C, you know, when I was, before I got my braces on, and then that kind of dropped to around a, E above high C. So um, finally figured out that it was the teeth, and so we started making my retainer kind of make my front teeth kind of like they had been. So that's just a side, <laughs> side note. So I made them crooked again, which my parents really loved. <laughs> um, and so I went to Indiana University and kind of just messed around. Didn't really have a lot of focus on what I was doing. Just kind of having a good time, enjoying stuff, playing, and it was all commercial playing that I was doing at that point. And after that, uh, moved to Nashville, and I, I had a good ear, and I had good skills, and I had decent range. Um, and so I decided, I'll, I'll make a go of this, and, and started working hard, and um, got on the General Jackson, which was a, a river boat, um, and I, I put my resume into a bunch of, of uh, you know, like J.C. Penny. No, I didn't know what I was going to do. So I, uh, I auditioned for the General Jackson. Somebody called the day of and said, "Hey, there's an audition for for the river boat." So I went there, auditioned, and they said, and I didn't have anything prepared. So I played, you know, something of Doc Severinsen's. I played some of the Brandenburg, and I played. Charlie A number two. And uh, they said, thanks, we'll call you if, 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 you, if we have a spot for you. So they called and I got, got a job there on the General Jackson. And 
started rehearsing for it and did all my rehearsals. And then the day before, um, they, they, uh, before we were supposed to start the show, the very curmudgeon trombone player said, well, what, what, uh, what jazz tunes do you know? What, what Dixieland tunes do you know? And I went, well, I don't know any Dixieland at all. <laughs> and he said, well, we play an hour of Dixieland music as they're boarding every single show. We did seven shows a week, so that's seven hours of Dixieland I need to play on week outside. So I went home that night and memorized 20 Dixieland songs, just the, just the head. And I didn't like Dixieland a whole lot because I hadn't been exposed to a ton of it, except for Al Hurt, which I like, I like him. But so I put uh, two 90-minute tapes in of Clifford Brown and let them play for the next six months and just kind of started, you know, floundering around and learning how to play jazz. Because in college, you know, I was the lead player, and so you give the jazz solos to the jazz players that can't play high, and you give the uh, another jazz solo to the guy that just doesn't do anything else. And then the lead player just got to play lead. So it was kind of that kind of thing. So, so this was a new thing for me. And uh, about that time, I started getting some calls to do uh, some session work. Some people heard about, you know, a new guy in town that could play some high notes. And so I, I started getting some calls. And I quickly <laughs> realized that my sight reading was terrible, and I needed to work on sight reading. That, you know, the blend and sound I had been playing on, on very laser-like equipment that, that was uh, not real blendable. Um, so uh, I, I uh, started working on that and honing in on, on the sound and realized that the other thing about it is that I needed to go back to those roots of classical playing because, uh, because most of what's recorded, you know, unless it's something very specific, you have to have really great skills, you have to have a good ear, you have to play in tune, and you have to play in time, and you have to have a really good pitch, and you need to do all that <coughs> right away, you know, or, or other, otherwise you just don't get called. So that kind of put me back towards working on classical, which I hadn't done since high school and earlier. So that's my path. Along the way, I went on the road with a Christian group called Truth. Um, I went on the road with Maynard when I was 21. So I was with Maynard Ferguson, and uh, now I've done about somewhere around 4,000 recording sessions, a little more, um, over the last 20, 20 years or so. And they're wildly diverse. I'll show up, and that's why I've got a bunch of horns and a bunch of mouthpieces, is because you'll go into a recording session and you'll have music in front of you. And, and a lot of times it's not very hard. It's not very difficult. Um, but you start recording right away right away. There's no looking at it, there's no running it down and rehearsing it. You're recording the first time you see it. And uh, um, you might have one song that's extremely classical in nature, and the very next song you might be playing high A's, but it's below double C. Uh, so it's just all over the map, and you just never know what's going to come up next, which I enjoy. It's a lot of pressure, and it's, it, but it's fun. And it, it keeps everything new and fresh for me. Um, so that's, that's kind of my background, what I do. And that gives you an idea of why I, a, I approach things the way I do. Um, you know, people will come to me and say, teach me to play high notes. You know, a lot of college students that I've had just want to play high notes. Well, my high notes come from me being able to be relaxed in triple time. And because that, that makes my chops feel good. And the more relaxed I am, the more... Uh, the more I'm not working hard or against my equipment, but my equipment is working for me. So um, it's, it's all kind of together for me. So my system of approaching trumpet has evolved from people that are very you know, analytical on one end, like uh, Jerry Franks and Mark Van Cleve and people that I've rubbed shoulders with that analyzed every little aspect of things, over to Bill Adam, who was very relaxed about it. He wouldn't tell you if you're doing anything wrong. He would just say, just hear the sound in your head and blow and, uh, and do the routine. So you, I have a mixed bag of background from, from when I came. And so I tend to not analyze unless I'm playing well. And then I'll say, okay, what am I doing today? Because it feels great. You know? and, and I'll kind of say, okay, I'm breathing. I have it here in my chops. My mouthpiece is clean. You know, what, what's, 
going on that's that's making this a good day? What did I eat? Did I get lots of sleep? You know, am I dehydrated? Am I overhydrated? I start analyzing those things when it's good, so that if I have a bad day, I can say is my mouthpiece clean? Did I not get enough sleep? You know, what's going on that's making me have a bad day? And then I can stop analyzing because that's not a great time to analyze because then you tend to kind of send yourself into a tailspin, which I've done many a time, you know, with equipment or this or that, changing things because I thought, I feel different today, what do I need to change? And usually you don't need to change something, you need to focus on, on uh, the sound and relaxing. So, uh, so you're gonna hear maybe some different things or similar things that you've grown up hearing that, that are you know, an approach or a way to, to play trumpet. And, you know, this may work for you, it may not. Um, so the way I approach it, I'm, I'm, I can work hard, but it, it, and I do work hard, uh, but in my nature, I'd rather just sit around and hang out with friends and go do something fun rather than work hard. So my, my approach is how can I get the best become the best player with the least amount of work. And uh, especially you kids, you, you're working, you have so much dividing your attention these days. And a lot of it is legitimate, some of it isn't, but a lot of it just takes time. I have three kids of my own, and so I, I see what kind of pressures are on them with homework and different things. And so um, this method, even if you use, even if you're approaching the trumpet with a different outlook on how to play, this method will work for you if you just take the, the raw material from it. So uh, I break it down into skills. I kind of say, here's the physical nature of trumpet. Here's your push-up, sit-ups, pull-ups of trumpet, okay? Here is music over here. This comes from your mind, your heart, your soul. This is, this is music. And they're separate, but they need to be brought together. And basically, you need to get this out of the way so that you can get out of you what you hear inside your head, okay? Because, uh, and it's, it's fun being a trumpet job. It's fun being able to, you know, play something faster than anybody can, triple tongue faster, play higher, all those kind of things. It's fun to do that. But at the end of the day, that's only great for the people in this room. And what comes out front, and, and, it, and it does get you noticed, which is a good thing. Uh, It'll get you some work, but then to keep your work, you need to have what, it, what is important, and that's you know, your sound, your pitch, your time. Actually, if I'd label it in, in order, uh, us trumpet players don't put it in this order, but what everybody else wants to hear is time, then style, then pitch, then sound, okay? That's the order that everybody out front wants. Because if somebody's playing out of time, it's throwing everything off. And that's ten, you know, the tendency for us trumpet players or brass players in general is to kind of say, you know, our time is kind of bad because we don't think about that until later on in our development. And it should be one of the first things we think of. So uh, I break it down into skills and I break it down into listening and how you approach listening. Uh, I would say that listening and playing along with rec recordings was 85% of what I what made me a, the player I am. When I listen to music, if uh, if I hear, if I'm listening to something and somebody else is talking, it, I'm not upset with them, but I, I don't do well with that. I, um, I, I it's it's a distraction. I have to go turn the music off if I'm truly listening to them because it's bothering me. Um, so when I'm listening, I'm singing through my head what I'm hearing. I'm fingering it in my, you know, either literally or, or in my head. So um, I'm practicing all the musicality things, probably even more when I'm listening than when I'm playing, because it's, it's telling me this is the way it should sound, okay? Whether I'm listening to a singer, whether I'm listening to a violinist or an orchestra or a solo trumpet player, um, I'm, I'm singing that in my head, and that's the way it's going in there, so that that's what I expect when it comes out, which helps me when I'm practicing my skills, because that's what I demand coming out when I practice those skills. 
So it's kind of a teeter-totter effect. You get better at your skills, you hear more nuances in the playing that you're listening to. And so now you're hearing more, and that ex makes you expect more out of your skills, so you'll practice more, practice differently. Uh, any questions so far on, on that? I'm gonna bombard you with just tons of information, and you know, don't be afraid to, to raise your hand. Um, uh, a lot of this is, are things that I did naturally as a, as a trumpet player. When I was growing up, there was so much music going on uh, in TV, movies, just, it was every place you turned. And so uh, it's not quite that way anymore. But um, back in the day, there was just, it was on everything. It was on all the cartoons that I watched, everything. And so I realized that just to get out what I heard gave me good, mostly good habits. Um, so a lot of this I had to go back and think, what am I doing? Uh, because, and or, or I'd hear somebody say something like tongue forward position. I, I heard that all my life, and I don't think it registered until a couple of years ago. What's tongue forward position? And I realized, well, I've done that all my life. So I'll talk a little bit about those things uh, because they work for me. Um, and don't let me forget to talk about warming up at some point. Because uh, that's, you have, you have your skills over here, which you, you practice daily, and that's kind of a routine you get into. That's different than warming up. You know, I, I come from a Bill Adam approach uh, in many ways. But a lot of Bill Adam students would say, well, I gotta do my routine before I can go play. And they'll, they'll practice an hour or two hours before they'll go play a job or something. And it's like, I'm tired out by that time. I wanna have fresh chops. So how do I, uh, what I'm showing you today is kind of a skill routine to work on skills. But when I go warm up, I warm up for five, 10, 15 minutes. And I put the horn down and come back a half an hour, 45 minutes, an hour later. And then I see what I'm gonna have to do that day. So it's two different things for me. Um, so breathing, lots of different thoughts on this. Um, the breathing I do is a, a little different. Uh, some people call it a, a high breath. Some people call it a wedge breathing technique. Um, some people call it a full breath. Uh, I find that it helps me be very accurate and articulate for all the different styles that I have to do and it helps things speak right away. Uh, so I'll breathe theoretically, and, and a lot of times science-wise science I'm way off, so don't, don't analyze what I'm saying from that perspective. But I'll, I'll breathe from as low as I can think to as high as I can think, and I'll let my shoulders raise up, and then I'll relax my shoulders. And at that point, my breath is kind of squished in here, in, inside my chest, with my, with my stomach supporting it, the muscles down here supporting it. So it's almost like somebody's pulling me up by a string, and it's almost like my belly button is pinned to my back in, in theoretical terms. Um, when you take this deep kind of breath, it's easy to get um, uh, tension. You don't want tension because it's gonna, you know, it's gonna come out of your throat or something like that. There's tension all over your body when you play, but you don't want unwanted tension. So this, this sometimes you'll have tension when this happens. You need to make sure that you can talk Afterwards. So if you take a deep breath and go, oh, I'm running out of steam. It's a little awkward to talk with all this breath and I'm tightening my stomach and it's all right here, but I can do it. As opposed to, oh, I'm running out of steam. That's the way it naturally wants to happen. So you need to be able to relax when you do this. different approach, different thing going on in my head, right? So, uh, that's my breathing. Uh, any questions on that? It's, uh, you could, we could spend two hours just on that, you know, really. But I'll try to rifle through these so we can get to questions, and then, you know, if people want to come up and try mouthpieces. Uh, I'm way into equipment. Uh, there are some people that are shaped on the inside of their mouth, their teeth, their tongue, their heads, you know, 
think of all the great players we love. You know, Adolf Herzl, uh, Maurice Andre, uh, Wynn Marcellus, Maynard Ferguson, uh, Doc Severinsen. They all have big hats. Not, I mean, literally, they all have big bobble heads, right? I mean, think of it. Uh, Bobby Shue, Chuck Finley, all of these guys, they got enormous heads. They're too big for their body. I guess I'm reading for it. I should be careful. <laughs> um, but they, their heads are big. We're not all created the same. Somebody that with a really thin face isn't going to have the leverage and the, the way to play as another player. How do you equalize that? How do you figure out a way for that, that person over here that has a different oral cavity to get out what these other players so naturally have? You know, a wider face, different things like that. Um, equipment, you know? Uh, and a lot of teachers want to downplay equipment and just say, well, just do these exercises and play a 3C or play a 1C or play a 14A, 4A, and you'll be able to do whatever you need. And, and it's, uh, and just blow. And that I, I take a different approach to that because I've had to sound so drastically different within five minutes of each other that I'm like, if I do this, I'm compromising what I need to do. So with recording, you can't really compromise. You have to sound this way for this, this way for this. And uh, you're gonna be demanded to play this extreme to this extreme a lot of times in the same day, same hour, um, so the only way for me to do that is by playing different equipment. Now, there are some people that can do that all on one horn, one mouthpiece, and they're amazing. But that's not me. That's, that's kind of how I started, but after I got braces, it was different from me. It was never quite the same. So that's, uh, that's my, uh, and we'll talk about more about equipment, but at the end, I'd like, you know, anybody that wants to play a mouthpiece, you tell me what you're playing on, tell me what you don't like about your playing, what you'd like to get better. Um, I have about six different mouthpieces, minus the, uh, let's see, I have about four mouthpieces that I primarily play on, minus my piccolo pieces, which I have two, and minus my flute, of which I have one. You know, but between, so I guess six mouthpieces cover everything I need to do on trumpet primarily. But out of those six, I'm mostly on the middle too, my, my smaller classical mouthpiece and my bigger commercial mouthpiece. I do most of my playing right there because that's where most of the money to be made is and most of what we need to do as players is right there. And then you expand outward for the more extreme types of playing. So my smallest mouthpiece, I, I don't play very much of the time. Uh, the other thing about equipment is uh, many people will say you need to practice everything every day that you're going to that you're gonna do, and I don't do that. I mean, I've played all of it enough that I know how it's gonna respond and what it's gonna be like. But, um, but if I need to go in the garage and build something, when I need to use the screwdriver, I'm gonna use the, you know, the Phillips screwdriver for that. And then when I need to use the hammer, I'm gonna use the hammer for that. So I go up and pick out whatever I need. Um, you know, and if it's, if you get away from something too long, it is kind of weird. But for the most part, if you're playing something with that, within every three, four, five days, when you go to pick it up, it's going to feel okay. So I want to be able to, to share that with you if, if you feel so inclined. Um, and Terry, Terry Warburton is here too. Terry's a wonderful friend. Uh, I've spent, I've come from a different side with mouthpieces. I've come from completely a player standpoint because my work is so diverse, um, I would wake up, I would, I would play a wedding ceremony on a Saturday night, and then I'd go play a reception for four hours, just obliterating my face and my ears. And then I'd have to get up with, you know, four, five, six hours of sleep and go play a church job the next morning, and my chops are all swollen. So that's not the way they usually feel when I pick up my big mouthpiece because I, I don't usually have that you know, practice the next morning after four or five hours of sleep on my classical room. I'm sleeping in if I have that or whatever. But if I, you know, if I have a church job or something like that, uh, on Sunday, after what I did Saturday night, my usual classical mouthpiece is gonna feel tiny because of the, my chops are swollen. So what do I do? So a lot of what I have done is realizing 
what works to switch back and forth from, not necessarily what is the optimum mouthpiece that I sound the greatest on. And that's a radical departure from a lot of people because they say, well, I sound the, the best when I'm playing the Hummel or the Haydn or the Artunian when I play my three C or one, my one and a half. Well, is that gonna work well after you, you did this? And so that's a little bit of my approach. It's, it's finding what works well to switch back and forth from in everyday life, not just what you sounded the best on in your living room or practice room at the school. Um, let's see. So let's talk about, we talked about breathing. Let's talk about tongue folding. That's something I heard for years and I never really knew what it meant until a couple of years ago and then I was like, oh, I've done that all my life. Um, that's basically saying the word mom, being relaxed with your chops, coming from a point of relaxation, not trying to manipulate your chops into something else that, they, that feels unnatural. Taking a breath through your mouth and your tongue comes forward. So I'll do it kind of sideways. You can, you can kind of see my tongue. Now. See how it's come through my teeth and my lips? You guys are all kind of far away. If anybody wants to move closer, you can. So right before I play, my tongue comes back, and then my lips come together so that my air is blowing my lips apart, okay? I'm not starting with a huge, wide, open hole here. My air is going to blow that hole open to the right amount. So if I'm playing really well. <laughs> as opposed to whatever my air is going to do is going to blow my lips apart the right amount. So I don't spend a lot of time thinking about, hey, I got one five. That was okay. um, I don't spend a lot of time thinking about, you know, where my aperture needs to be or how wide open or how closed it needs to be. That's just a natural thing as I'm playing. Um, uh, tongue, tongue coming forward kind of stretches out my chops the way I want them to feel. If I don't do that, uh, I sound a little bit like this. That's really how I sound if I don't take a breath through my mouth and put my tongue forward, which is probably why I started doing that right away at an energy. Make sense? So uh, that might be too in depth for some, uh, but that's how I approach uh, getting started, taking my breath, tongue full. Uh, the next thing I go to is just basic fundamentals of uh, breathing. Since we are trumpet players, we focus on our sound kind of first because you know, nobody really wants to sound like that first thing that I just played. You want to have a more relaxed, open sound, whether it's really bright or whether it's really warm or full and ringing. Whatever that sound is in our head or whatever we need to do for the music, um, that's what we want. And, and the way to get that is by doing some long tones, making sure that you're breathing right, making sure you're playing on your face. So I do what's called expanding long tones. And I tend to... I do expanding long tones and I start on middle C, uh, not middle C, but C in the staff, um, so that I move each direction from that point. Because I don't want to get stuck down low, I don't want to get stuck up high, I want to move in both directions. Um, a lot of people start this on G, I spend a little bit more time playing in the higher range usually, so uh, I start on, on C. And, and you just hold it for a few seconds, take it off your face, and then do the next one.
are unemotional. I'm not playing music right now. I'm doing push-ups, sit-ups, pull-ups of the trumpet, okay? It's the physical act. So I'm trying to just get a pure sound, relaxed. I'm trying to play whatever comes out relaxed. So if that sounded loud to you, that was my mental forte right now. That was my relaxed. If I, uh, if I, if sometimes I'm warming up and I'll play intentionally soft. But when I'm doing a routine type of thing, I'm just trying to play what's ever relaxed all the time. Um, so that I'm not working to play soft, I'm not working to play loud. Um, that's my approach for that. Any questions on long tones? They just continue to expand out each direction. It's not a range exercise. It's not, um, it's not something else. It's just to be able to, to make sure that you are breathing properly, to make sure you have it on your face, to make sure you're getting a, a good resonant sound, okay? Yes. How far do you go? Not you, but the player. Uh, as as Maybe not. Oh, that's a good question, and it, and it makes me answer it like this: If you have twenty minutes, not very far. If you have ten minutes, not very far, because you want to touch on all of your skills every single day. If you have two hours, up to high C, you know. Whatever, whatever register you feel comfortable with. It may be up to a G above the staff, maybe up to a high C. When I was in college, I took it up to high Gs, you know, double Cs, whatever, because I was thinking that was a great idea. That's not really needed for that. This is just to make sure that you, you're playing right, that you're relaxed, that you're getting a really effortless sound in approaching to trumpet. Um, one, one more thing. Yes. I'm just playing it for what I have time for. I might hold it for four beats. I might hold it for eight, 12. I'm not, it's not, I'm not trying to deplete. I'm not working on my breathing other than I'm trying to pick it up and just play easily with a resonant sound with my chops buzzing freely. Um, and I say buzzing, they're not really buzzing, but you, vibrating freely in a relaxed manner. So that, that's what, all I'm thinking of. I'm not overthinking it. I'm not analyzing it. I'm just saying, I want a pretty trumpet sound. How do I get that? Take a good supportive breath, breathe out, you know, singing it in the way you would hear in your ear, whether it's, you know, brighter. shallowest mouthpiece, but I don't want to do that because I have, I'm playing Doc Severance and Maynard's arrangements tonight, and I need to save it all right there. I can't. Because I'm not really a soloist a whole lot. I don't do this very often. If I seem awkward to you, speaking to you, it's because I am. I don't do this. I, I stay invisible be, behind a microphone, and I like that. I enjoy that. So this is outside of my comfort zone. Doing concerts where I'm a featured artist, it's not something I do a whole lot. Um, so but I do enjoy it. It's just, that's the way my whole life started and then I started doing session work and now nobody sees me and knows who I am. But they've heard me on, you know, if they play in a video game, they're, they're hearing me play. If they hear, you know, some movies, I'm on some movies, I'm on tons of country albums and, and Christian artists and then if you're playing with a company, here an accompaniment track in church or Brooklyn Tab or any of that kind of stuff that you might listen to, I'm on all of that stuff. So. Um, so uh, that's, that's that. Whatever sound you have in your head at the time, that's what you're getting at. Um, and this is kind of like building blocks. You know, they're not necessarily in a, in a perfect order as we go along, but at the very beginning, they're, they're pretty much in order. You know, your breathing, your embouchure, your, your approach. It's kind of like a golf shot. If, you, if you've ever played golf, you know, you don't run up to the ball and do Happy Gilmore style and just slam into the ball. <laughs> You, you come up there like Ben Hogan, you address the ball, and I sound like I'm off this awesome golfer. I'm terrible in my head. But you approach, you know, you set up, and you, you know, you think about what you're going to do. It's the same thing. It's a methodical approach. It's, it's building a house layer by layer. And so, yes? 
Can I back up and ask a question about tongue forward? Yes. You, you said your tongue actually comes through the lips when you're setting up. You're, you're articulating, are you actually articulating on the lips with the tongue, and then after you articulate, you just hold it up, where's your tongue? Is the, is the my, tongue still my forward tongue, through the teeth? Nope. My tongue comes through the teeth, through the lips, and then right before, here, I'll get closer. Everybody, everybody try to come down here, but if I do this, I'm like this. You know that tongue? Right there. Right before I play, here's what it looks like. It all went back. My lips are touching. Uh, all it did was kind of spread my chops naturally without me going like this or something like that, which a lot of high note players do, including me, back, back years ago. And it's how I cut myself at, you know, when I was working at Disney World. I played on a cut for like two weeks, and it really messed me up because I had scar tissue then. And it's, you know, each time we abuse ourselves in some way, we'll have those consequences for years to come, if not for the rest of our careers. Um, but um, it, it comes back. And then it's just back there. When I tongue, it's probably like where my top teeth are. I'm probably hitting around there. You know, if it's a tower power kind of thing, it's probably more in between the teeth. If it's Maurice Andre playing really, you know, pretty triple tonguing that's melodic, it's probably even a little bit higher up. It's probably more legato, da da, that kind of thing. So where is it after you actually articulate? Is it back behind the lower teeth? Um, no, it's back. Uh, behind the upper teeth, but I have friends that have their jaw stick out naturally more, and it's behind their lower teeth. Uh, so that depends on you physically, uh, and I don't think you need to analyze it that much. I think more than anything, you need to take a breath and, you know, let that come there. I mean, I'm talking to you right now. It's set up on my top lip, but my bottom lip is going to come back in, and I'm going to go. Make sense? Mm -hmm. And you hear that, that's kind of some compression coming forward. You know, I, uh, I grew up where they said, go, which works great for playing classical music. It doesn't work so great when you're gonna start your uh, high F sharp, you know, above high C for, for pop music, you know. And, I'll start. and this is why I did this, because, because when I started doing session work, I realized, um, when I go to do this, I'm, I'm sliding into the note. I'm not hitting the note cleanly. Talk amongst yourself. I don't want to freak my chops out too much. All right, so you hear this compression in the sound. You hear it? So that compression, that gives me the air so I can hit that point of that note in tune, in time, immediately, and tongue it the way I want to. Now, you see me switching equipment. Can I do that on my bigger mouthpiece? Yes, but it's a lot more work. It's not giving me the sound that I want on cake. It's not cake anymore, but it's not giving me the right sound for that. Um, it's not the right approach. So why should I work hard to do some, you know, unless you're practicing and working on endurance, you don't have much time, so you work on a big mouthpiece, kind of like swinging two bats. That's fine. But when I get to music, I'm not going to do that unless, unless it's supposed to be a really round toe-toe sound, but who writes what I just played in that style of music? I mean, that doesn't come up to me. Um, so that's that compression that you hear right before uh, I play. Um, so the next thing after sound is, and, and, and now we, now this, all of this can go in different orders. Uh, now we get to, uh, for me, fingers, you know, so you, and, I, and I usually just work out of the uh, Yarvin's book, but the Clark book, all of those things are, are excellent, you know. Um, so for fingers, I'm just trying to get a consistent hand position, especially with my right hand. Left hand, I usually hold it like this because that's the way I started. Sometimes I'll grab it like this, or this, or even this, depending on what I'm playing. You know, when I show up to orchestra, you know, and play with the symphony and stuff with them, and I 
we're usually playing classical music on the first half and then pops on the second half. You know, if I'm holding my C trumpet like this, the principal player will look over and say, you can't hold your C trumpet like that. Um, move it back. Um, just as long as you can get to whatever you need to do to move it to play in two, that's all that matters. This pistol grip kind of puts shifts a little more pressure to your lower lip, which is great for when you're playing a lot of high stuff, but if it feels comfortable for you to hold it like that. Um, and so right hand, you know, I, I always thought, again, that there were so many specific rules. You know, if you played relaxed, like you're playing the piano like this, you need to have your finger here, you need to have, you need to have this finger out, and that was totally uncomfortable for me. So I ended up being like this with my finger in, because I use pressure when I play high some. And, uh, and, but I was like, okay, you can't play flat fingered and over like this. But then I met George Tidwell, who's a fantastic jazz player. And, uh, and he plays, he's got pudgy little fingers and they stick way over here like this. And he's doing this and I'm like, well, he's not be able, supposed to be able to play really fast, but he is. So, you know, in, in a clinic with Doc Severson, when I was growing up, I heard, you know, somebody asked him the question, uh, what do you think of when you're playing really fast? And he goes, well, I think about the music. And then he says, Actually, if I start having difficulty, I'll, I might start thinking about slamming my vows. So I learned, okay, slam your vows. But then, you know, f 10, 15 years ago, I heard a classical teacher say, play as just relaxed as you can, don't slam your vows. And he had great fingers. So find what works for you and keep it consistent. A consistent hand position that, that you can work with a metronome and work on consistency. And when you work with a metronome, work at a slow tempo, and every once in a while, go as fast as you can, and it's gonna be sloppy and bad, but it's pushing the envelope, pushing the boundaries of what you're capable of, and then come back to the middle ground where that's kind of uncomfortable. And that should be where you spend the most time with the metronome, is at that uncomfortable spot, trying to get that really even. You know, so whether it's, and my fingers are not very good. <laughs> And so practice at all different tempos. Whatever. So that's how I kind of practice that. Uh, any questions on fingers, hand position, any of that? Okay. Okay. Uh, after that, I go to tonguing. And I used to uh, try to, you know, being classically trained, I kind of approached it like all toe, 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 you know, that kind of bouncing. Yes? Okay. Uh, over the years, there's been some combinations with jazz. The skills. Yeah. You know, the, the trill, certain trills, you have to find alternate fingers and form. How do you overcome the trouble of the relationship between the, the fingers in the difficult spots, like second and third finger? Well, I'll tell you, especially with classical music, some of the people that I respect the most will just pick up a different key to horn and then they'll compensate if the sound isn't what they want with a different, with a different mouthpiece. So they'll, if they go to a smaller horn, they'll put in a bigger mouthpiece because they want that same sound and they'll just, they work hard to not work hard, if that makes sense. Um, you know, I put it like this, you know, my, if, if my first finger has a master's degree, my second finger has like, you know, is a bachelor and my third finger didn't even graduate high school, it's a, it's a total retard, okay? So I, I struggle with that, that's maybe, you know, at this point, since I don't have as much time as I used to when I'm developing as a player, I don't have as, uh, you know, I don't have a lot of time to practice. I have, you know, three kids that are, you know, I'm always driving somebody someplace, and so if I'm, if I'm not working, I'm in kid mode uh, at this point in my life, and so I, I see it laughing. You know, and, and, and then when I get on a session, I, I throw in a mute if I see something coming up and I'm like, man, I need to get that under my fingers. Um, and there, and I can think of, you know, I make it sound like I'm this great classical player, I'm not. I just, that's part of what I do that makes me a complete player. Um, and so, my, you know, I, I was on a session, and when you're, when you're recording stuff, you're, it's not your job to tell an arranger that they didn't arrange appropriately for you. It's your job to make it sound great no matter what. And so, you know, I come and I'm like, oh, this is ridiculous. 
this, this is idiotic. That can't be played. So I'm, I play on my B flat. I can't play it, you know. And it, it's unfortunately we haven't. I see it in the stack, and the stack is getting smaller and smaller. And I'm still not finding anything. Play on my C. Play on my E flat. And I finally put my D, you know, my D bell and my D slides on, and I practice it on the deck, and I finally said, oh, I can play this, you know, because I look at the tempo, and I barely got it out, you know. Uh, same thing for one time when you know I went to play, uh, you know, so the first time I played hoedown, the third trumpet part, uh, in a symphony concert, I showed up and I glanced at the music, but I didn't look at it and see that what is it in F? Or I can't remember what it's. I can't remember. All I remember is that I was not prepared, and I looked at some of the stuff that I had to play alone, you know, answering because it's independent, and I'm like. So as they start the song, I'm taking my E flat bell off and I'm getting my E flat out of the case instead of my C trumpet, which I was going to play originally, and switching everything out. And it got to the part, and I could play it. And it was like, whew, you know, because I hadn't worked on the transposition of it or anything, and so it saved my butt. And then I went in the next, the next rehearsal, and I had practiced it, and I was ready to play it on C. But those kind of things, you figure out what you need to do at that time to be able to sound good so that you keep on being called for work for you players that you know are younger it's so you can get work you know figure out what you need to do to be prepared because that's one of the things that when we get into talking about work if you want to ask those questions it's you know showing up on time you know looking nice blah 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 not making anybody mad keeping your mouth shut speaking through your horn and and not doing anything dumb and and basically playing through your, you know, speaking through your horn. So, and, and sometimes I do that really well and sometimes I have, you know, and so we learn both ways. Uh, fingers, tongue. So I used to practice this, you know, just with a round sound, thinking, okay, classical sound, you know, or my version of the classical sound at this point. tonguing like that. So uh, once I realized that's not covering all the styles, I started practicing things different, differently. And, and so wanting to practice as efficiently as I can, I pick something like Circle of Fifths and uh, what's this exercise out of the Arvin's book? bunch of single tonguing in and this routine is just like okay I've got 20 minutes today or I've got two hours today or I'm noticing that these skills are all right about here but this skill is down here so for that skill you might practice 5 10 15 20 minutes you might do that for one two three weeks or six months because it's so important I spent before I played the Carnival of Venice when I was in high school I spent six months Practicing, you know, I practice my skills, but I practice mostly triple time uh, to be able to do that. You know, when I got into college, I, you know, I was high note guy, so I practiced a lot of high notes. So that that I worked, I, I would practice all of the skills, but I would practice that more. So whatever you see lacking in your playing, you don't you want to touch on every skill every day so that that never dips. But um, you know, if a skill is down here, or if you're getting ready to play the circus, let's say because that was something that I, I did when I was in college. Um, you know, I started doing lip slurs and tonguing and just turning the page while I was holding and just keep on doing that. That was a skill that I worked on for, you know, two weeks a month, something like that. And, and whenever you practice a skill like that, it tends to kind of cap out and then you'll find that after a week or two goes by where you stop practicing, practicing it that much, then it actually gets better after that. So it's like you get, it keeps on getting better and it kind of stops and then you then it goes back down into your routine where everything else is. You start practicing something else and all of a sudden it'll go even higher. So it's again that teeter-totter effect I was talking about with uh, practicing music, hearing music versus uh, skills. It keeps on going like that. It's the same thing when you're practicing inner skills. 
Um, multiple tonguing. Uh, if this tightens you up your throat or makes you gives you unwanted tension, this might not work for you, or you might need to do some long tones or lip slurs or something to make sure that you're relaxed. But practicing all the different syllables uh, and trying to make everything sound like a single tongue is what I what I did when I was working on it to make it even so that when you do your fingers, everything's working right. So I'd go to that Arvin's page 155 and practice that first line or the first exercise or the first page, all with single tongue, then go back, do it with your ka, ga, whatever syllable you use for the second. And then I triple tongue it, and I do it all at the same tempo, trying to make it all sound like single tongue. So. <laughs> is on the horn and the mouthpiece combination of whatever you're doing, whether it's small stuff and you're playing up high or if it's a bigger mouthpiece and you're playing down lower, find out where that is and you just lean up against that resistance. Okay, you're not trying to crank a lot of air, you're not trying to move that resistance. Find out where that is and you lean up against it. Okay, that's it. and we're going to talk about that more because that's a really important thing in uh, working with your whatever equipment you're using and not working against it. Okay? And it, it helps you pick the right equipment for the job that you have. Just like, you know, go out to make something in the garage, screwdriver for this, hammer for this, saw for this, whatever you need at that given time, you're going to use. So um, uh, that's the way I worked on it. And then, you, and then working with a metronome. speeds, working a lot of fingers, passages very slowly, uh, but you're getting your single, you're getting your tonguing even by practicing the different syllables. Same, same approach for double tonguing. Any questions on multiple tonguing or tonguing? Okay. Uh, I tend to use a legato tongue uh, because you can always shorten up the note on the back end and you don't want it to be real chippy and real, you know, kind of harsh usually. Uh, there's times for that, but most of the time it should be pretty fluid. Um, flexibility, range, and endurance. Uh, this is a good time to tell you about, I have a range CD, although I'm not sending out the CDs anymore. I, you know, I'll send you a PDF and, and the thing that you can download. Uh, but range, endurance, and flexibility are all closely tied together for me. Uh, you approach the, the actual exercises differently uh, if you're working on endurance, you're just going to keep on going page after page, and you're not necessarily going to take it up really extreme in the high register. Uh, if you're working on flexibility, you're not going to focus on the range and taking it up in the high register as much, but you're going to work on maybe playing it a little lighter, a little quieter, and trying to play as relaxed as you can. You're going to allow movement in your chops, but you know, when I was a kid, I realized that by pivoting my head, I could actually move the note. You're going to not want to have excessive movement. You want to be, you don't want to stop the movement, but you don't want to do it on purpose. Okay, so, uh, and I'm singing, ah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So if you have, uh, has anybody ever seen that video of Maynard Ferguson playing Maynard Ferguson? Who's seen that? That's incredible. You guys need to YouTube that. Maynard Ferguson plays Maynard Ferguson. It's with him in his early 20s with Stan Kenton. 
and he's doing these, you know, like fourth and fifth shakes. I, 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 like really fast. You don't see anything moving. The only thing that's moving is his tongue. And a lot of teachers, a lot of people are afraid to say, use the E syllable because then you'll tighten your throat and you'll play with a thin sound. It's not a thin sound and, and you know, stuff is tightening and relaxing all the time when we play. You need to think of it as an open syllable, but just a different syllable. So you think, ah, 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 ah. It's not ah, it's not pinched, it's open, but it's a different syllable. And your, your tongue is moving just like when you whistle and move your notes. But, and your jaw comes along for the ride a little bit, but again, it's not the movement that's of your jaw or anything that's really changing the note. It's just, it's trying to get that energy all up front, right where your chops are, are vibrating to make that note change as easily as possible. Okay, when you get to range and take that up higher, you're gonna, um, you're gonna wanna hear, you're gonna hear a more of a popping sound when you do this, and that means that you're in the center of the note where the horn is putting it, and that's what you want. You wanna be as efficient as you can you never want to be lipping it one way or another uh, as you're playing higher or in general. You don't want to be lipping it one way or another unless you're blowing slightly down on the pitch, but never up. Uh, so when you do this, you, you, you should want to hear a clicking sound. And you're teaching yourself muscle coordination and airstream. So by gunning the note, you're actually kind of defeating the purpose. So yeah, when you're playing a lead chart, with a big band or something like that, you want your high G to be enormous. You want to bury the band at that point. But when you're practicing range, you want to be able to get that in a way that your airstream and your focus is getting that note for you. So think low, loud, high, soft. It doesn't mean that the high, higher note is going to be necessarily softer, but it shouldn't pop out and be louder, OK? Resistances. Okay, so I play a bigger piccolo mouthpiece, a deeper cup, not the bigger inner diameter, but you know, deeper cup because I've got plenty of resistance there without the mouthpiece, just by that tightness of the horn, of that small of a horn. So unless I'm playing, you know, which I've never been asked to play with Michael Hyatt, but you know, if I did, <laughs> I would play a shallow mouthpiece. But if you know, Brandenburg probably too. But for most piccolo stuff where you're not playing above a high G. You can use that resistance and just lean right against that, okay? Find out where that is. And so, again, I'm not belting it out like I'm playing the Doc Severinsen chart. I'm backing off. I'm finding where that resistance is, pushing up against it, and just supporting with that air that I talked about at the very beginning, that is the high breath or whatever you want to call it. Lots of support here. That air is compressed here. But when it comes out, it's relaxed. I can say, ah instead of, uh, okay? Um, and then when you approach it with this, if I'm playing something that's commercial, I'm finding where that resistance is. Again, talk amongst yourselves.
So I'm, I'm thinking, relax. Now I'm not, I'm, not prayer, I'm not playing it soft high. I'm playing it loud. I'm playing music now, right? But the way to work on it is ah, yeah, ah, yeah. Low, loud, high, soft. Keep that in your mind. It's not going to be soft, but you're thinking there so that you, you approach it the correct way. Any uh, questions on flexibility, range, or enough? Uh, I don't... I don't think it's a good idea to practice range every day. I don't think it's, I, I don't spend very much time on my shallow mouth beats. That's, that's a specialty thing. That's an extreme thing. I don't play, a, you know, above high Ds most of the time, high E flat, so I can play that on a, on a bigger mouth piece, and that's what I do, because I like my sound for that. But when I need to, as long as it's not in a live concert where I've just been playing like Sousa marches or something like that, I can pop in a, a smaller mouthpiece, a shallow mouthpiece, and, and play it effectively. Um, so again, I, I spend most of the time on those middle mouthpieces and then branch out as, as music dictates. Um, let's see, sight reading is a skill. And I already said that I was, when I moved to town, to Nashville, I, I wasn't very good at that. So sight reading is another skill. Um, you should do it um, two minutes to five minutes every single day, you know, up to 10 minutes. Different types of, of uh, manuscripts. Try to read, you know, computer printouts, the jazz fonts, that those always kind of make my eyes, especially as I get older. I'm like, what does that mean? You know, what is that rhythm? Because it's so fancy, I can't really see it. All the way to handwritten, you know, scratch that you can barely, you know, legibly see. If you're practicing all of those, reading and looking at all of that different material, you're just going to get better and better at that. So it's not just a matter of picking out a, a you know, a different characteristic study in the Arvin's book. It's a matter of getting your hands on some different music or printing some out from the internet, just one page of something that that's out there, and saying, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to practice this, and I'm going to. I'm going to look at the key signature and the time, and I'm going to look at it for 20 seconds, 30 seconds before I start. I'm going to see how fast I have to go and pick the right tempo so that I don't do something that I can't do. And then there, I don't have a lot to say about sight reading other than the more you do it, the better you're going to get at it. Um, when, you're, when you're sight reading, you can't go back and fix something. Okay, So it's got to be in time, always moving forward. And you know, I'm not a person that says, you know, if you can't think negatively about something, but if you if you miss something, you can't be thinking about that. You've got to be looking where you're at and maybe slightly ahead if it's slow enough to do that. But pretty much you're kind of focused right where you're at. And uh, um, saying out loud, when I was growing up, they had these deep thoughts with Jack Handy. This is the perfect analogy for sight reading. And it's the one where he says, uh, if, you, if you drop your keys in a stream of molten hot lava, let them go. Because man, they're gone. It's the same thing with sight reading. If you make a mistake, <laughs> let it go. It's in the past. You can't change it. You can't fix that. So keep on moving. Keep your eyes there. Don't become distracted. Because all of us do that. We're sight reading. We're playing something, and we make a mistake. And we're like, oh, I made a mistake. OK, now you've just lost. Just by the act of saying, I, I made a mistake, or what just happened. You're, you're, you've done the train wreck for what's coming up. So, uh, sight reading is a skill that you have to work on. Question. Yes? Do you see much manuscript writing in the studios anymore? Or is it all computer generated? Stuff? Almost all of it is computer generated. And when we do see it, it's really bad. It's really bad. Um, I won't name the composer because there's probably people that know him or know of him. But he was famous for showing up and writing the next chart while we're recording in the bath chart. And it, he was really fast, but literally, I mean, it was like three or four parts on one staff, and you, and, you know, all your accidentals, and you're like, oh, I can't do this, you know. One guy got slap happy, I remember, on a session. He just, he started laughing. He couldn't control it because it was just so intense, and he, and he was a great player, too. And it was just like, we had to stop for like five minutes for him to compose himself because it was ridiculous. We've been recording for five or six hours and we just lost it because it's so hard to read, you know, those inner parts. Fortunately, I'm up on, I'm on top or bottom on grade, you know. Don't ask me to play an inner part with four, four handwritten chicken scratch parts out. 
But uh, um, yeah, most of, and that's why it's it's scary when you come to it nowadays because it's it, most of the time people, you know, we record a lot of gospel print music that that goes to the churches, and so when we do that, or even even artists like Brooklyn Tab and, and those kind of things, when they when they do that music, it's going to be made available for the public, and so it, it might have mistakes and it might not be in its final layout when it comes to us, but usually it's it's you know pretty legible. Um, it's very rare that we get, you know, two or three or four parts on a page, but when it does, it's always like, oh, I'm gonna make some mistakes, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna look bad. To a keyboard player that, you know, plays that, sees that all the time, and they're like, well, what's the problem? What's the deal with the trumpets or the brass? We, we're stupid, we can't figure it out. So, um, um, let's start talking about music. That's, that's the skills, that's general, makeup of the skills and uh when we and when we talk about equipment i'll talk more about leaning up against that resistance and finding that resistance because and i, I won't play anything real high because of what i have to do tonight on my bigger equipment but i'll just tell you what it sounds like it sounds like i'm working harder it sounds thinner although it's not really thinner it's different overtones you're hearing so it's more lows and mids it's not the highs so when you go to play a high G with a bigger mouthpiece, it doesn't have those highs in it. So it doesn't sound the same as if I play it on my commercial equipment um, in that way. And so, uh, and sometimes it's appropriate to play a big mouthpiece for your high stuff. And sometimes it's appropriate on a concert to say, am I writing a, a, a check that my chops can't cash? Meaning, Am I gonna be able to make it through on this big equipment? And if, and if you're not, that's the perfect time to see if you can play it on a C trumpet or a D or an E flat trumpet. And I know many people don't have those because it's expensive. Then you should buy another mouthpiece. Find something that bridges the gap for you so that, because remember, we're worried about having the ultimate trumpet sound. We're worried about those things. Out front, they're hearing chipped notes and time and pitch, okay? The last thing that they're going to hear, and they will hear it, is, is the sound sticking out. But if it's in the ballpark as an ensemble, it's important for your time and your pitch, you know, and those things to be, and you not missing those. So, you know, uh, I came from, you know, the school that said, you know, you use a B flat or C trumpet for pretty much everything, and here's how you do it. You play a big C, you know. <coughs> You know, because I wasn't, I was young at the time, so they're like, yeah, you play a 3C, and if you're not strong enough, then practice more. There's a good amount of information with that, that's true. But, like I said at the very beginning, we're not all created equal. So, if somebody here can't do 100 push-ups, can only do 35, what makes it easier for them? You know, doing it on an incline. I could do 100 like this, you know, right? How do you equalize that? Different mouthpiece, different equipment, you know? Uh, same thing for a, a snow skier or a water skier. Just pick any athletic event, it's the same thing. So because we come to music, you know, in education a lot of times we're like, well, no, this is the way it needs to be done. Well, I disagree. So um, uh, consequently, when I started working for a living, I started seeing, okay, it's not acceptable for me to run out of chops. It's not acceptable for me to chip those notes because it was higher. Gotta figure out something, whether it's switching a mouthpiece for those 10 bars, whether it's practicing it on a, on a different horn, you know, whatever it takes, that's what's important. And that, and, uh, and the big thing is finding the resistance of that. So, and I'm playing everything, this is not my biggest mouthpiece by any means, but it's more, it's kind of, it's a, this is like a 12 rim, so it's kind of small, but with a 3C cup and a classical backboard. Which is, I'm a big fan of that. Getting, if you're, if you're having to play a lot of lead, or, you know, Jeff, I think you look more commercial work, some of you guys look more commercial work, you play a smaller mouthpiece for that. But yet, when you go to play classical stuff, you're thinking, well, I need to keep the same rim. No, you need to kind of keep that same high point area of the rim so it feels similar on your face, but you can go to a bigger size. So 
you need to keep you need to keep a bigger cup to get to get that thing that will blend. So if I go in a symphony with a seven rim, but a three C cup or a one B cup, uh, my sound blends with the section. <coughs> I sound like they do, especially out front. Now, if if we're trading something off, my sound might be slightly more concave, but it's going to have the same character of sound as the person that's playing the really big mouth. Okay, so that's what you want in blendability within the section is, is uh, the same sound. And that comes from kind of the same cups, unless you're playing the high part. Then you can get away with a lot more. Um, so. that uh, and so I find that resistance um, if this is the wall of resistance it's a little further away so I'm like back here pushing okay so now where it is and then leaning up against it. Does that make sense? This is probably the biggest thing that makes somebody successful changing equipment, whether it's a horn or whether it's a mouthpiece, because we want it to feel the same. And feeling isn't what is important. What's important is the sound out there and picking the right tool for the right musical job. So uh, does that make sense? Any questions on this? Because that's 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 a really important thing that I, I think a lot of people say, uh, and, and like I said, there's different approaches for this. A lot of people are very, very successful just moving a lot of air all the time with whatever equipment they have, and they just use big equipment. That works for some people. It does not work for me. So uh, in that case, this has been a key thing in allowing me to figure out how to switch back and forth in equipment. Uh, the other equipment kind of thing is that uh, if I sound the best on a 3C and I sound the best on this really, really tiny mouthpiece, that's all great. But if I have a job that requires me to be able to be versatile and switch around, I might not be able to pick those two extremes as mouthpieces that I play. Why? Because I might crash and burn because this is just too big, or the high point is in a different spot. When I say high point, if you take a mouthpiece and rub it on, on a counter, you'd see a line where the high point is, and that can be further in, can be in the middle, can be further out on the rim. That's kind of, if you look at, I play wildly different mouthpieces, but the high points are all in a pretty similar place, so that's where I feel it. Some people feel the outside of the mouthpiece, some people feel the inside, some people feel the high point. So you kind of, that all matters when you're figuring out how can I switch back and forth, what works for me. Um, and I can help with those kind of things, but it took me 30 grand of my own money over from the time I was 16 till the time I was probably 35, you know? I, I mean, I sold some of these, so it's not like I had all that money. But, you know, it was expensive. That's why I finally said, I might as well start my own line of mouthpieces because 
I understand this from a player perspective, I need to get money back for those expensive ones. So uh, that's, that goes a little bit into equipment. Uh, Horn-wise, I pick horns that are middle of the road. Uh, it's always fun to play. Like tonight, I'll be playing Doc Severinsen Maynard charts. Well, um, it'd be much easier to play that on a lighter, bigger horn. It's just more relaxed. Claude Gordon, Benj, for me, I've played those before. Um, you know, a, just a big, open, bright horn that's free blowing with a small mouthpiece. That makes it really easy. Uh, but what I do, again, is so diverse. And, and the only way to make a living is being diverse. If you're in an orchestra now, you're going to play pops concerts. And you're going to play for artists that wrote stuff to high F sharps, high Gs, and play a whole program doing that. And you're going to have to figure out a way to do that. If you're playing, uh, you know, if you're a lead player, you're not going to get very much work unless you can go play a church job or go play a wedding, different things like that. And so you need to have that in your arsenal. And if you don't, you're going to be very limited, and it's just going to be more of a hobby. And that's fine if it is just a hobby. But if you want to be called for more things, you're going to have to be diverse. And so this is a way to facilitate that. Any question on, on that? The, the horn thing I tend to put towards the middle. So I play on box with blackburn bells, because I like the sound that a blackburn has. Um, you know, my E flat. Uh, you guys have heard of Charlie Melt. He, he kind of fashions, he'll say, what C trumpet sound do you like? And, and he'll put that bell on there. And then I'll pick a medium large bore, uh, B flat or C trumpet. And he'll make me, he'll cut down the pieces and make an E flat trumpet for you. And that, I can get away with more playing a little bit smaller mouthpiece on my E flat because it's all Bach parts and it's a little darker. Whereas a lot of people play a big mouthpiece with their E flat, so shilkies are a little bit brighter. And, and that's, they've balanced what they want out of a horn in that way. I balance it thinking, okay, when I go to work, I'm going to have really, I don't know what is going to be leading up to that work. So I want to have something in the middle with that horn so I can have some leeway with my mouthpiece I put in. Does that make sense? Um, Let's see, classical music. Um, I'm gonna miss a lot of people, but I listen, I listen to people that inspire me and that play lyrically. Not people that necessarily have the perfect approach. So like, I'll, I listened growing up to Lynn Marcellus playing classical music. You know, who cares if he started the trill on, you know, the top note or the bottom note and he was wrong because it was broke or classical <laughs> style and got it mixed up. The point is, is that, and too, you know, too bad that he played that so fast that, you know, that inspired me. It's not the right, you know, speed for that time period. There's times when you have to go play it, you need to do it correctly, yes. And that might require more work of you going and finding the person that played it correctly or, or learning more about the genre. But to listen and to be challenged and to be inspired by music, uh, I listen to people that move me in that way that breathe life into music and don't make it necessarily about trumpet. Again, trumpet jocks, that's fun, that's cool, but that's not what everybody else wants to hear. And so we need to move beyond that. So I listen to Sergei Nikaryakov. Um, you, who know, raise your hand if you've heard of Sergei Nikaryakov. Awesome. For those of you who don't know this, he was a violinist uh, from the age of like four or something ridiculous like that. And then he got in an automobile accident, and, and he got hurt, and so he decided to pick up an instrument that would be easier than violin. Trumpet. Figure that one. <laughs> so I heavily disagree on that. But he picked up trumpet, and he plays like a violin. And he picks up flugelhorn, and he puts an eight-inch bell on it, like a trombone, and has another valve, and he plays that like a cello. So, so you have somebody that was discovered when he was 11 that could do things that nobody else could do. And by the time he was 13, he had his first album out. And he recorded something called either No Limits or No Limit when he was 25. And he plays cello and violin concerto on it. And it not only is it the most unbelievable thing you've ever heard, it's really musical. So uh, that inspires me from a musical standpoint, but also
also from a trumpet standpoint of like, this is the best thing ever. Like he's, he's playing all of this incredible stuff and you hear it and then he starts triple tonguing and all of a sudden you can barely hear what he's doing. But he's circular breathing while he's triple tonguing. And he's going, and it's, not only is it just that, but he's moving fingers and it's fourth, third, fourth, fifth, and octave jumps where he's going. And he knows his part, it's a background part. There's other, you know, uh, the, the melody shifts to the violins or something else to that point in the song or violas. And so all of a sudden he's got this really back, cool background part. Well, any other trumpet player would have mixed that up from saying, hey, look at me, I'm the best. But he puts it way back. And it's like, this is where this fits with the music. So, um, Sergei Nikiriakov, Maurice Andre, Wynton Marsalis, I'm missing tons. There's, what's, Timothy Doc? Yeah, I mean, these guys, uh, his, when he plays stuff like this, I'm gonna tell you half this. The, the worst part about this being video is picking different stuff up and talking and having dry mouth and then having that what he sends is embarrassing. That's the deal. You hear him play something like that, and it's just like, oh my word, that's. And he stretched something out musically, body, ba, 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 ba. and he still keeps the whole thing in time, but he stretched that out. So musically, you have those things going on. So listen to people like that. Um, you know, for it, orchestral, you know, it's still fun to go back to, you know, and listen to Adolf Herset, Bud Herset. You know, that's what we want to hear still. And there's a lot of people that still want to hear it. It's, a little bit toned down in orchestras more these days, but that's still a good reference point because then you hear the phrase, and you can actually hear the trumpets playing all the parts that you want to learn. So that's still a good place to start. How are we doing time? We good? Okay. Um, for jazz, I, I tend to want to hear people that, that are good trumpet players. I don't like listening to bad trumpet players. It's a distraction for me when I'm, when I'm listening to music. So I listened to, uh, to Clifford Brown, who just had tons of facility on the trumpet. Nicholas Payton, uh, Claudio Roditi. Anybody heard of Claudio Roditi? Okay. That, these are names that, you know, if you come to me afterwards, or you, these are names you should write down. You should look at them on YouTube, whatever. But Clifford Brown, Nicholas Payton, Claudio Roditi, John Swan, classically trained <coughs> trumpet player. I think he played like a 3C and a you know, I think he used to play like a, a Bach, but he might be a Martin or something now. Uh, Till Broner. Who's heard of Till Broner? Okay, climb like a stump somewhere. He's like a rock star in Berlin. He plays trumpet, but he's brought trumpet into, you know, he's my hero in this way, in that he's found, tr he's made trumpet relative, re relevant uh, in pop music. So, you know, it's a lot of singing, a lot of different stuff. He's got music videos. He's just, primarily, he's a great jazz player, but he's got high chops, he can play up high, but his, his sound is so beautiful, and he can change it drastically. I can't do what he does, but he can play, the, you know, with harmony, make it sound so airy that you're like, how is he getting that much air in his sound? It's so cool sounding, but yet he can play, uh, just really fast and up high and everything. So John, oh, that's Till Broner. And if you if you look for something, try to get something. Uh, it's called Live in Berlin. That's where he's playing a lot of jazz. But if you look up, look him up. He's got videos with him singing and, and all sorts of stuff. So he's made it relevant um, to the point of like a rock star status. Um, high notes, uh, early Maynard. All of Maynard, but early Maynard is what I listen to because it's it's such good playing. And nobody's ever, out of all the high note trumpet players that are truly great, Arturo, everybody that can do that, nobody has ever captured what Maynard did because it's all kind of copying Maynard. Uh, you know, I asked, uh, somebody asked Adolf Herseth who their favorite trumpet player was, and he said Maynard, you know, in a, in a clinic that I was in. 
one time, and it was like, huh. You look at you look at Maynard playing physically. You look at uh, Bud Herseth, and they look the same. They look the same physically. It's very interesting. Watch them on YouTube clips, and you're just just really relaxed, no drama, just blowing air through. And it's like they're thinking it, they're hearing it, they're singing it, and it's just coming out. And that's what the skills are for, is to make it so that it just comes out. Uh, Doc Severinsen, any period of Doc. I mean, he still, I've played with him twice in the last two years, and he still sounds amazing. Now, he is an equipment geek. He, uh, every single time over the last 15 years that I've seen him, he's playing something lighter. So the way he's playing, he still is a very physical man, the way he approaches the instrument, but he's getting older. So how does he still keep that sound that he has in his head? A change in equipment. For him, to make it easier, he's going to lighter equipment. I tend to play really heavy stuff and smaller mouthpieces. He played a little bit bigger mouthpiece and uh, and you know more narrow rim like Jeff here plays, you know, and and he works really hard at being physical about it, but he's found a way to do that and still keep that same sound that he's had since the '60s. So uh, Arturo Sandoval, just unbelievable. He's a little bit of a freak. He, his approach is drastically different. You know, he kind of compresses his lips together when he goes into that altissimo stuff, and it doesn't sound the same. But it's still really exciting and really neat to hear. Bobby Shu, he's kind of like the lost guy that never really made that, you know, hero status for a lot of people. For us, you know, that are trumpet geeks, we tend to know him in these circles a little bit more. But it's like you put Doc and Maynard together a little bit. I mean, he's got a little bit more Doc sound, but he's still got that raw excitement that Maynard had. Um, uh, so. Bobby Shu, if you hear him playing solo solo stuff, and, and I think there's some recordings floating around of him like with North Texas band in the 70s or something like that. Um, lead players, Johnny Audino, uh, whoever was playing like with Sinatra live at the Sam, anybody know who that was? I'm not sure who it was. But what? really, live at the Sam with the, who said? Could be Bud Crispoy. What, yeah, I don't know who it is, but you know, like Lefty Lady. I don't think that that's no, God's. I think that's Bud Bruce Boy. Okay, so that's you know that kind of stuff. There was another guy that played with Count Basie during that time period, a black guy that was just amazing. I don't know his name. Uh, Al Aaron's maybe. Maybe, and he, well, yeah, I think he spent a lot of his career at the end in, in France, over in Europe. I don't know. It's hard for me to keep track of all these guys because I, I listen and I look who up who it was and then I forget, you know, because they were invisible. They were the invisible trumpet players, but they're our heroes because they made the music that we listen to exciting. Uh, but Comrade Gazo is, I think, by far the most definitive sound guy that we heard that wasn't so soloistic that he became a distraction for what was going on in front but he was soloistic enough to set himself apart from other lead players in his singing approach to playing. So these are the players that we need to, that we need to listen to and, and to put into our mind because you are what you eat, you sound like what you listen to. So if, the, if you listen to the guy next to you in band and that's all you listen to, you're not gonna be a very good player. Even if they're good players, you know? If you, if you constantly say, I'm gonna sound like Doc Severinsen. I'm going to sound like Doc Severinsen. It's all I'm listening to. You know, I'm going to sound like Jerry Hay. It's all I'm listening to. If, if I'm going to, I'm going to sound like Adolf Herseth. You know, pick a person, whatever genre, whatever sound you have in your head, and and listen to that constantly and say that's what I'm hearing, and that is what is going to pull these skills and all of these things along so that you sound like that person. It's what's going to dictate your equipment and what how you buy your equipment and what you what you spend your money on to try to sound like that. Um, listen to, don't just be a trumpet geek. Listen to the violinists. Listen to solos. Lyrically, the way they phrase, that's the one thing I hear from young trumpet players a lot of times is they're not phrasing. They're phrasing like somebody that doesn't either know the lyrics of a song if they're playing a standard, which is, they probably don't. Um, but they're phrasing like 
a trumpet player playing the notes. And, and once we've gotten the trumpet out of the way and once we've mastered these skills to a certain extent, the music has to come so that we can hear, so that we approach that in this way. So vocalists, you want to listen to, you know, no matter what your politics are, you want to listen to Barbara Streisand. You want to listen to Josh Groden, Sting, Andre Bocelli, uh, Gina Benelli, who am I missing? Uh, just all those, all those lyrical, linear type of vocalists that sing good melody lines and that phrase that way, you know. That, and I don't necessarily listen to this person a lot, but when I've heard her lyrically and, and the way she approaches things in her phrasing, you know, um, Celine Dion, people like that, put that in your head, not, even if you don't like the music. Put that in your head because you're going to sing in that way. You're going to sing through your horn. Uh, and I'm trying to get all of this as quick as we can so that we can take a short break. And then I want you know want every one of you to come up here and buy three or four mountains. <laughs> so, but uh, but we'll take a break after I finish this. And that, and I want to answer any questions because you might have questions about what it's like making a living or how do you start making a living or. Uh, I'm playing in church, and I've got this. I'm getting a hand all the time from the director. What do I do? So we can, we can answer all these questions. Um, uh, and I'm familiar with that. I am familiar with getting the hand. Sometimes I'm familiar with getting just one of the parts of the hand. Um, so role you're playing in the ensemble. Personally, as a player, uh, how do you know your role? If you're playing third trumpet, you shouldn't be playing a Schilke 14 8 player. <laughs> You should, be, you should know your role and what that, what that entails. You should be playing something that not only you can sound good on for yourself, but something that is adding to the overtones of the players above you, especially the lead player, okay? Uh, because he's probably not gonna, he's gonna have more high overtones in the sound so that he can relax and play on top and do what's needed for a whole concert. He's gonna have to have that kind of equipment a lot of times at least. Um, that, that's a really important thing, knowing your role, what your job is, you know, knowing how to step in different roles and, and facilitate that. We can talk about that if you have any questions. Um, playing relaxed. That is the only way you last. Um, those of you in this room that have played for a living or play for a living know that uh, a lot of people can get a, a symphony job but not many people can keep a symphony job because of what's demanded of them daily. If you're not playing relaxed and learning how to play with your equipment and not against it, you're not gonna make it through concerts. You're not gonna make it through, you might make it through one concert, but you might have a whole week of just really strenuous playing and you're not gonna make it through that whole week. And then you're gonna bomb on the second concert, you know, whatever. Um, cover tools. Um, I never, uh, coming back to mouthpieces, I never want to show up to a job and not have what I need to sound good. So, you know, I have mouthpieces that I hardly ever play. And I'll show up to a church job and I'll play this. Like, here's my deeper commercial mouthpiece. I don't want to hear that, right? That's that's too. It's not the right sound. It's not the right tool. Okay, and I'm just using that song as an example. You know, but if I come in, I'm. Is this the right approach? Maybe. to this, something I hardly ever play, but it's a flugel cup with a trumpet, shank, and a, you know, your rim. You know, and I might need that to blend with flugels or blend with trumpets. Or I might need a flugel wrench, you know, yeah. with a flugel mouthpiece, a really deep funnel with a big hole that's going to give me the right sound. 
not a more trumpety kind of sound. You don't want that. <laughs> feeling I can imagine as a trumpet player, well, I don't have to imagine, it's happening, is showing up, playing a gig, and crashing and burning, because you tried to do something that wasn't the right tool. So, um, trying to play a concert on too small of a mountain, is, that's awful, you're sticking out, you're trying to back off and manipulate your chops so you have the right sound, you just picked the wrong thing. You need a bigger mountain, you need the right tool for the right job. Um, showing up, you know, thinking, okay, I, I, I can play these notes on this mouthpiece and I'm fine, but showing up for the concert and you had a rehearsal on, and the conductor over rehearsed something and you, then, then you ate salty fries at McDonald's because you didn't have enough time to eat and all of a sudden, my mouthpiece feels too big. I'm not, it's not responding. Now you're crashing and burning on that side. So I got to show up and have too many mouthpieces in my mouthpiece pouch, something that I use only once every three months. But when I get that, you know, when I show up to that church job and I have that really exposed solo, you know. So um, that's the way to set yourself apart, you know, as opposed to this sounded okay. But if it's just you by yourself in a, in a church or something, man, that's, that first one is the, the right call, right? For that, maybe. Uh, depending on what's going on in the music before and afterwards and what it's what mood it's supposed to set. So have too many mouthpieces to facilitate, have too many horns, have the, the equipment, find deals on stuff that you need to, to complete your arsenal so that you don't show up and say, oh, I wish I had that. I wish I had bought that Patrick mouthpiece with that cool. <laughs> Whatever. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I can even stop joking. That. But you see what I'm saying? It's a terrible feeling knowing that you could have done something better and, and wishing that you would have. So uh, let's take, what time is it? Anybody know what time it is? 12. 12.04. It's 12.04? Okay. Uh, let's take a quick break. And if you want to come back and play some mouthpieces, you know, take them to a practice room, take them, just bring them back if you don't mind. Uh, but I, I don't mind you doing that and, uh, and telling me what you're playing on and what you want to figure out, asking me any more. What questions do you have? Any questions before we? Yeah. I want to clear up something you had early on. Maybe uh, help me understand. You talked about breathing in and then talking afterwards uh, with perhaps a scooter or something. Is that to help reduce the tension then? Are you trying to? No, I was just talking to you guys. I was just saying I. I oh. When you I see talked what you're about breathing, uh, and then you talked about talking right after you breathe. Uh, that's like the litmus test. You don't do that in reality. You do that to see, am I, do I have unwanted tension? My name is Steve Patrick. I live in Nashville, Tennessee. Okay, it's awkward. It's, it's a, a different sound. It's undue tension. It's not this. Inhale. My name is Steve Patrick. That's the way it wants to come out. I have to concentrate on relaxing with that amount of air held that high. But that amount of air held that high makes me able to go. Same air 
it's the same focus, it's the same compression, it's how I allow it to be released. And it's, it's, like, it's like a water faucet turned on full blast at the house, going through the hose, and your nozzle at the end. You can either, it can either be on full, it's on full blast supporting behind it, but then you can either release it you know, small or huge fast stream, whatever you want to do. Small stream for the low notes. I said, I don't analyze very much, but that's the compression. That's Got it's it. probably the, the compression before I started. So, and it's like uh, that. Another brings up one other thing. I don't go like this. If I'm going to move that table, I go like this. Now I push it. So, and I also don't stand like this. Okay, I'm going to push this table in a second. That, if you held your air in like that. That's dead air. You don't want that. You don't want to just wait indefinitely. It should be a pretty quick process. It's not. It's. Stop it. Get that point. Get that clean attack. And it's. You can get away with not doing that for a lot of. You can get away with it for big band and ironically classical music. You can't get away with doing that for pop music. split four notes before I'm done with the first ten. And then I'll get on my game. Make sense? That's preparing to push the table. Yeah. When you're working with flexibility, you go past your thirds or your fifths or your octaves or whatever, uh, you're doing slurs. How do you eliminate the stuff in between? Like if you want to do an octave slur with an octave or even more, without catching the notes in between. place for a second and I'll think about that. <coughs> tell you that. I'm thinking about, I'm singing. I'm literally hearing, not the ah ya, I'm hearing the sound of Doc Severance in my mind right then when I'm playing that. tongue's moving. My tongue's arching, just like when I whistle. Maybe that's it. What else? Anything? Okay, I think we have this room until, what's the next thing in this room? Two o'clock. Two o'clock. So I'll be here till like 
40, unless somebody kicks me out before then because they need the room for a reason, you know, maybe 130, 140. I'm gonna run to the restroom and then I'll be back here to answer more questions, try and ask you soon. <coughs> and I'll be back with my horns in 40 minutes. Thank you. Appreciate it.